My name is Kanish Parashar, and uh, I'm founder of Coin. And uh, Sorry asked me to come in, and I think Brady also sent me a message saying, come talk about something. So then I thought like this is a good place to talk about uh, launching crowdfunded startups. So I'd love to know a little bit about you guys, too. I mean, there's not too many of you in here. Want to go around, and I'll just like uh, know your names and what you guys are doing. Brian Cannon, the founder of uh, Wink Labs, and uh, we're making a smart picture frame, sort of the next generation of digital photo frames, personal displays. Okay. okay. Eric Norman, founder of Palette Home, making it easy to create restaurant quality food at home. Actually, we're uh, interested in whether we should crowdfund, and if we do, should we do our own? You did or whatever. Okay. Uh, Joachim Astun, uh, one of the founders of uh, Shortcut Labs, we make these little. Uh, Shortcut buttons that you can configure in the phone. Uh, so it launches an app, or uh, yeah, or uh, it opens any kind of function that you can imagine. Pretty much like this is just set to make a sound. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. But you can do whatever. Uh, and we're right now in the in the dialogue with, with awareness that I know you used. Oh, I see. And, th and that's like a Bluetooth 2.0 connection. Uh, Bluetooth for Bluetooth Four. Low energy. Okay. Uh, my name is Amir, also with Shortcut Labs. Hey, I'm Kaya. I'm Kaya uh, with Keyboardio. We're making comfortable keyboards that are also incredibly open. Um, so user What's programmable, user oh. hackable, um, I see. that sort of thing. Uh, I'm John Fitzpatrick. I'm an uh, embedded systems engineer with Poto. We're making a little Bluetooth camera that can stick anywhere. You know, put you back in the selfie. <laughs> oh, I see. I'm DJ. I'm meeting with Team Poto today. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, we just met him today. He's interested in working with us. I'm Eddie. Um, it's a little camera. You stick it kind of on the wall. You can see a, a preview on your phone of what it sees. Trigger the photo remotely or video, and it'll send it to your phone. Does it do uh, detection, like motion detection? Uh, yeah, we could we could work that in. But the idea is less of it as sort of an ambient sensor and more of like you can actively kind of just stick it anywhere. Uh, you don't need to like install or anything like that. Can you use it in like car racing or something? Just like stick it in their dash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm John. I'm Highway One Content, so I'm just here to take notes and possibly turn this into a blog post or five. <laughs> um, Nick, I'm with Six Sense Technologies. We're making um, connected test and measurement devices for mobile workforces. For mobile workforces. Mm -hmm. Donald. And Mary, Karen, we are Sensio, you know, smart clothing company helping people to stay fit and improve performance. What do you say, smart clothing? Smart clothing. Clothing? Yes. So what does it do? Like it helps you get fitter or? Yes. Like we, we have the, our uh, special fiber technology to, yeah. to uh, you know, to detect the heart rate signal and send out to a smart device like cell phone, you know, smart watch and all that. And people can have a fitness goal, you know, personalized training experience. Uh, wearing our, our smart clothing product. Oh, that's cool. So. Yeah, and I'm Karen Kishansky, <laughs> design for Sensilk. And Mary, product engineering for Sensilk. I'm Brady. I know you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am Pedro from Lumo. We are making an interactive projector for kids. Interactive predictor? Yeah. Like predictor of behavior? Mm -hmm. predictor, predictor of behavior? Projector. Projector. Oh, projector. Yeah. Oh, like you can touch the stuff. It's like uh, uh, HCI. Yeah. You can play with it. Something like that. Right. Uh, my name is Daniel from Modular, and we're building industrial grade robotic components that you can put together like Lego. Ah, oh, cool. So, kind of like like arms building cars kind of thing. Yeah. But you can assemble it. Like, but like industrial production quality sort of robotic systems, <coughs> but you know that consumers can put together cool. for funsies. I well, I have something really informal because I took some notes on my phone, but um, I'm just going to go through a little bit about the things that uh, the coin team went through as they kind of launched and the stuff, uh, the stuff that happened that made us fortunate to get a bunch of um, news stories and et cetera, et cetera, to get us a good you know, crowdfunding campaign. So I can talk about kind of like the experience and hopefully you guys can gather some details from that, like what we did, you know, and 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 then if you guys have questions like, what's the downside of like Kickstarter versus your own website and stuff, feel free to shoot it at me. I think um, 
um, there was a there was so much put into the launch of coin that some of it I don't remember anymore. But the basic gist was that like we did probably did like 50 things, of which three things were valuable, and the rest were useless. You know, it was like that. So let me start going through some of this. So this was now about <clears throat> August or so, and we had decided that we would launch the company because we thought we could build it. And <clears throat> because we don't want to launch without knowing, you know, we could build it or not. And I have a little, I have one with me so I can show you guys. And, and basically, I had never launched a product before in this domain, so I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, you know, like you want to make a big hit. Anybody at a startup has a dream, and when they get out, they want to see that people care about what they did in some way, shape, or form. And before you launch, you want to make it as big as possible. You want to have the most interest possible. So I was like, what can we do here? So first thing that we did was we launched another product for fun. So this was the, this was the coin BLE kit. It was basically just a iBeacon type thing, you know, and a simple app on an iPhone. And all it did was basically once you turn it on, it just sent like, you know, um, like data back and forth. That's all it did. So it was supposed to be for developers to use to make toys or whatever, like to use as a platform to make something. You know, like one guy was going to make like a, a bike uh, turn signals. So you can put your, I put your iPhone right here and you can say left or right and then the device is back there and it's turning on lights saying you're going left or right. Like simple stuff like that. And what happened was this, um, made a crowdfunding site, and then it was just some e-commerce site, just used it. You know, then um, um, I got the guys ready, they're like, okay, you guys want to deliver this? They're like, yeah, we want to deliver this. And we launched, we got like, I don't know, like a thousand orders, and they got like one tech run story. And then afterwards, we realized, oh my God, now we got to deliver these thousand. So we had a CM in mind, we put to the test, and what we did was give them all the designs, we finished all the code, you know, we got the PCBs order, we got them um, assembled, and then, you know, actually got them shipped in like a month and a half. So what we did was that before we launched, we actually did an end-to-end -end crowdfunding campaign. We, st we, like, we thought of it, we did it, we delivered every unit, you know, and then we're like, okay, I think I'm getting a hang of this, like how this works, right? But we want the coin launch to be much bigger than this launch. You know, we want it to be, you know, yay bigger. So <clears throat> the way that happened about was that um, there were different facets of the launch that we had to really cover, right? And there were certain things that we kept in mind as we talked to like possible partners about how who we get involved with, right? And some of the key things that, and some of this seems obvious, but it's easy to o overlook when you're actually doing it because you're busy and you're under a lot of pressure. First thing is every single person you hire, every partner, you know, um, that you're looking to get involved in, Make sure they genuinely love your product for some reason or another. You know, it has to be somewhat personal for them. You know, they have to be like, look, you know, I'm not going to tell you this because I need to make money, but I would just do this for free. It's important to find those people. You know, if they are also experts at what they do, you're like really good. You're you're off really well. But, you know, it's not. It's good to see people's reputations, but when they really are personally into what you are into, it really makes a difference, right? So. I talked to I don't know how many people before I started finding folks who were like, oh, yeah, you know, like, I really want that thing. You know, so, you know, for example, the video guy, uh, this guy named Adam Lesegor, he, um, he was like, I was talking to him on the phone, you know, and he was like, he was like, yeah, yeah, I want to do a video, yeah, but um, there's only one condition I'll do this. I was like, what is that? He's like, I have to star in it. I'm like, well, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so so I like I saw like how much he wanted it, and I'm, he's like, yeah, I charge like you know, I guess I can't give her his rates. I charge like X thousand. I was like, I only have X divided by ten thousand dollars to pay you. He's like, okay, fine. You know, so it was it was that type of thing where people really wanted to get into it. You know, the these, the the PR guys, you know, um, they were so much into it. Like, you know, the day I met them after that, like they were inviting me to all these events and baseball games and all this stuff because yeah, they really wanted to get into it, and they're you know. And all I had to do at that point was vet them, like how good are they, what they do, you know? So I spent a lot of time getting references and I spent a lot of time like talking to their team, understanding, you know, um, how good they are, you know, before making the decision to work with them. And, oh, and references is really important. Everyone that I worked with was highly recommended by my network. So the connections were super strong. This is because what, it, what that does is 
it makes them like really perform because they don't want to let down their that you know that uh, that really really strong connection that connected you. They don't want like inherently you don't want to let that connection down. So you in inherently do a good job whoever you connect to. So that was another good thing. And last but not least, like I said, you know, there were, I think we did probably 30 more things than ended up working. So, and I can't even remember all of them right now. Like I had a possible partnership with a case maker. So their cases and our coins was all together. You know, like it was all sorts of like stuff that some of them just didn't happen at the end, but it was all ready to go. So with that in mind, what happened was we went out and we hired the video guy, which was a sandwich. Uh, we worked really hard on the website, our own website. And the reason we went on our own website is because we're all software engineers too. So it was just as easy to make a website, that, you know, it just felt a lot easier than making hardware. So what we did was we really tried to improve the UX of the website to the point where we felt it was a really efficient and really easy website. We were trying to target a demographic of males from like 20 to 50s, you know, who, who like, like kind of like shock and awe style, you know, quick thinking, quick decision maker. So we knew the website had to be really simple, like no bullet points or anything like that. Just simple, few facts. We even left most of the features out, which backfired later. But, but basically, just made it really simple as possible. And the way we improved it was not because we thought we knew what we're doing. We had uh, guys come into the office like every couple of days. So we would make a change and we had like several guys come in, use the website, and we just kind of record them and watch them. And then we would improve it and then we had more guys come in and so on. So we kept doing this several times to the point where like we were stripping out things and moving things around and, <clears throat> and uh, improving the site to the point we felt like when you look at it, it just becomes obvious, you know? You don't have to really use your mind that much. You just, like, it just flows. You know? And that was really important. And last but not least, um, I was advised towards and against a PR uh, company, PR, cons PR, PR consultants. But after talking to probably about, like, I don't know, eight or ten different companies, uh, I felt like it was important because, simply because I don't know how they would help. You know, I don't want to skip on something. I don't know how much it would help. <laughs> So what I decided to do was I decided to get the one who was the most interested and not the most prestigious one uh, because uh, I felt like, you know, um, that people being interested will be more valuable than someone who's like a super expert who kind of cares about you, you know. So the way that it worked was this, okay. The video was getting generated, the website was getting tested, and about two weeks before the launch, I went on this big, like, tour with the PR guys where we went and pitched like 20 something reporters under embargo. Okay, this was really important. Okay, so this is like two <coughs> weeks before. One week you're in New York, the other week you're in SF. You go talk to every single reporter and convince them, like this is like pitching VCs, okay? You convince them to write a story about you, which means is that you're completely prepared. You have your demos, you have like exactly what you're gonna say. Um, you have the most, you know, you have the most caffeine in you. So you can be happy throughout the day because you're talking to like five people a day, and um, you do very best to convince them to get a story. This is this part is so important because this is what ignites the fire. You know, this is what gets kind of like things rolling. The stories. You know, so if you have a PR firm, make sure your New York tour and your SF tour are all lined up, and that you have prepared a pitch just like you would pitch VCs, like that level of preparedness, and they'll help you with that know, basically, to how to pitch. I also did, um, like, some other trainings, like how to speak in front of uh, reporters. You just don't want to say certain things. Um, how to kind of, like, address questions that could be negative towards you, which is also good when people actually try to, like, criticize you. It's also very good for your company. So, but there's a way to address it, you know? And the, the way to address it is not to say, like, oh, my God, they know my weakness. <laughs> you know, it's, you know it's, more, it's more like, you know, you, you, you just kind of like disagree with it. You just say, actually, something else. Well, anyway, so this, this worked really well for me. And so what happened is this. So after all this stuff was prepared, we were ready to launch on like um, a Thursday. And the reason we were ready to launch on a Thursday, you know, and I don't know if it's good or bad, but because on Monday, usually it's some like people are just like kind of like catching up on stuff. Tuesday, some, always there's some big news that hits. So you don't want to like have your company launch next to like, I don't know, like Facebook, you know, I don't know, something or other. And Wednesday is kind of like, 
so the other news catches them on Thursdays, like this empty period where you can launch, you know, and and generally it's a good time to launch to get you know eyeballs on your stuff. I found out it's a bad time to launch because on the weekends people just stop surfing the internet, you know, like it always just drops off. But it gets you that initial bite, basically. So that was all the preparation, by the way. And there was a few other things that we didn't do, like you know I had to deal with some case maker. We would sell cases together for really cheap. Um, I forgot even. There was so much stuff, but this is the stuff that worked. Okay, so what happens is on the morning of the launch, um, the reporters like follow the you know the embargo and they start putting the articles out in the morning. So with every article, you'll see like if you look at your Google ana Analytics on your site, you will see a bump in traffic. Okay, now your only goal at that point is to make sure that. Everyone who gets to your site buys your, your stuff. You don't want people surfing your site and leaving. That's a waste of your time and their time, right? So to do this, you know, there's only one thing I feel like you can do yourself to help uh, people convert, okay? Which is, if someone makes a decision to pre-order, you know, pre-purchase your stuff, they would spend the least amount of time to actually check out. You know, and, and the reason is because Let's say you know one million people hit your site, okay, and then out of that, like let's say I don't know, uh, hundred thousand decide to buy, and then let's say that you know fifty thousand of those are really busy people. You know they have work, they have kids, they have telephone com phone call calls coming in, and all this kind of stuff. What will happen is, as people are actually typing in their information, they're gonna get disturbed. You know they're gonna be like. And they get a phone call. They're like, oh, crap, it's my boss. You know, and take the phone call. And then they completely forget. They never come back. So you have to make sure that if someone makes a decision to purchase your stuff, that the amount of time it takes them to do it is like the least amount of time you could possibly take. Right? So which means is that, is that the amount of clicks they do has to be minimal. The amount of stuff they have to type has to be minimal. So what we did was this. We always had like the buy button kind of like big on the screen at the top where the eyeballs like stay the most. And then when you click on it, the page that comes up, the next page that comes up where you buy is just a single form with the least amount of information that we need in order for them to check out, which is email and card number. We had the zip code in there because when we did feedback, people were freaked out that like, look, you just got my email and my card number. Like people just didn't feel right about it. So we added zip code just to counter that. In fact, people felt better when they put the zip code. It's like, you know, on gas station, you put your zip code? People are like, oh, they're verifying me, right? Yeah. But you don't need it. So it was just that and the quantity or something, you know, which is defaulted to one. So you don't have to even choose the quantity. It's already one if you're buying one, right? So what happened was um, that form allowed people to just, like, if they made the decision, but then, like, if you know your favorite card number, you're checked out in, like, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, you know, before anything would disturb you, stop you. So we got really high conversion rates. You know, they were like sitting at like five or ten percent or something like that. You know, and a lot of times, in like when you look at this stuff, conversion rates will be sitting at one percent, you know, or less than that. And that that really helped because we were utilizing you know all this press as they were coming to our side. We were converting them to customers, right? So that was really really key. The other thing was. Oh, yeah. So the other thing was uh, referrals. So uh, the biggest incentive is cash. You know? So what we did was we made it after you purchased, we made uh, this new style referral. Well, we, didn't, we made it ourselves, so I consider it new. It was just basically the URL to, to our site with, uh, with your own referral code. And it was really easy to kind of like, now you have bought, share this for $5, right? It was like this. And then it would be five dollars, but it, would, it just it just like was big and bold in the center, and there's nothing else you could really do on the page, right? So what happened was a lot of those people shared. Like as soon as they bought it, they shared it on Facebook or Twitter or something, you know. And all of a sudden, we're getting like you know we had like hundreds of thousands of Facebook mentions in the morning, and then like it was like five tweets a second. Like it was, it was like an engine, you know, that started kind of cooking right after the, like people started coming to the side. So what happened was the press kind of started it all. And the referral stuff kept it going for a little while. Like, in fact, like if you look at Twitter now, 
like you'll see these URLs like pop popping up like you know, several hundred a day, um, just because people you know people want to make the money back. It just there's an incentivized to do that. So that that was really the key to kind of like keeping it going and um, keeping it top of mind. And a lot of people coming up and be like, you know, I heard of you guys through you know my Facebook. You know, I didn't. I mean, I'm like I don't know if it was you and all that kind of stuff happened for like months after that. So all that you know, all that really added up. Uh, and made a big difference. So I mean, those are the most important things, actually. Those things really made it happen. And I think recently someone like just followed that. I don't even know what they did, but I saw this this uh, company called Move M O O V, kind of like follow the same uh, exact same thing. It just kind of looked like I thought it was like our site at the beginning, you know, and you know. They had they had like similar stuff going on, but they had like orders, you know, lots of orders and stuff like that. So uh, it seemed like a good formula to get it going. But I think I'm interested in finding like as you guys and other people do it, what else works and what else really really makes a difference in these campaigns. That's pretty much it. All on my notes. Do you guys have any questions? Why did you go with your own platform, I guess, besides Kickstarter and or Indiegogo? Oh, um, well, I talked a lot to Kickstarter and Indiegogo and tried to see, you know, um, how it could help. So first thing I found was that, you know, they have a lot of projects coming in. Their goal is to get as many projects on their site as possible so they can find that gem and have a big hit and make their name, make, you know, get revenues, take part of your shares. So, I really didn't believe in like giving away like revenue, first of all, you know, because it's just a website. That I thought, you know, so I was like, I can make that website rather quick. Um, and second, you don't get any traffic unless you make your own traffic anyway. It's not like they send traffic to your site. Um, well, they might. I'm not sure if you have a special deal with them, but it didn't seem like you would get traffic just because you're on their site. So I thought, well, if there's no automatic traffic, and I'm limited to their style, like their user experience, you know, which I thought was good, but it wasn't like exactly what we wanted to do in our, our, for our side. I was like, it's better to build your own site. It was more work, but we were able to like really, really like um, put everything exactly where we wanted it. All right, so those are two big reasons. Again, if you don't have software developers in your team, then it's, it's really difficult. You know, then you have to like get help. You have to hire somebody, or you have to. Um, it might be better just to like use uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo or one of these guys. I'm very curious about the first project you did, the BLE uh, <coughs> shift. Was that did that really? Would you have done that again? Was that a useful thing, and did it help sell the team and make the campaign bigger, or did it feel like a distraction? Uh, it was both. Yeah, because we were shipping out the last of those while we were trying to cope with the coins launch. So it was a distraction uh, towards the end. But the reason it helped is because, you know, it's like taking your second swing, right? It just, you just know like, how to swing better in a second swing, right? And that helped a lot, right? Because I saw, what, I mean, what I saw was basically this, right? Um, people are really busy. They have so many things to do. They really don't care what's happening. Somebody has to, something has to grab their attention, right? And with the, the BLE launch, you know, I don't know what to expect. And we, when we sold like, I don't know, where it was like 500, 1,000, I was like, this is nothing. This is a lot more than that. You know, and that got my fire start. I'm like, look, <laughs> I don't want, I already spent like a year working on coin. I don't want the launch of that to like be all like fizzle. So what I was like, let me go find more ways to make this work. You know, so it was, I actually considered more of like a failure than a success. You know, and that made all of us, the team, like really start rallying to figure out how to do a better job in the next one. You know, because we don't want to sell 500 of them. You know, we, were, we were thinking we'd get several thousand orders. You know, but again, it has to be done right, so it really helped us with that. When you were testing your website to see how effective it was, I guess, the, it sounds like you did it mainly through sort of the human observation. Did you do anything electronic as well? Like I hear people User testing? Yeah, user testing. Yeah, we did some user testing, yeah. But you know, that wasn't as useful as in person. That's what I was kind of Because in person, you can guide it. 
So I used an app called Exec. I don't know if they're still around. I think they got bought. They're they are gone. They're gone, right? Okay. Yeah. They became a cleaning service. <laughs> they're solo, right? Yeah. So the reason it was useful is because like the moment I'm like, I really ever test, yeah, yeah, I hit exact and they would show up in like within an hour. So I'd call like one after another and just like um, it was just e easy easy resource for human to, to get people. Yeah, to get people in. Okay. Much faster than TaskRabbit. So you can use TaskRabbit. You can be like just show up. And you just got way more than just doing because I mean I would get advice from people, oh you do this fake web, you know, Facebook ad or something like that and get this data, but you recommend more the human process. Yeah, because when you're looking when you're just watching someone do it, um, what happens is that you know, you can kind of like, it's like real time for you, right? And you can see what they're doing and kind of like see how they're doing it differently than how you imagined it, you know? Yeah. And then it just helps connect the dots because what will happen is there will be some common elements across everyone's, everyone's uh, work. You know, like for us, uh, I think the big, one of the biggest thing was like, was uh, that we didn't have any buy buttons anywhere. So I was like, go buy it. And people were like, okay. And then it was like five, ten seconds of finding like the button. It was like dumb. You're like, you're like, duh, the button should be there, right? right. But turns out that when you're making the stuff, you always forget something. Right. It's just the case. So I was like, oh, the button should always be around, just so if people do want to buy. In fact, I wanted to put the form right on the page, because button is one more click. Yeah. So it's one more click away from purchase, and that one click, we probably lost conversion. I'm, I'm guessing because people had to click one more time in order to convert. Into a, into a customer, so I would just put the slap the I would just slap the the form, even though it looks ugly, like right on the side. It could so even just it could expand too, right? You could email and it expands to credit card. Like yeah, that's just a good idea. Yeah, because it lets it gets you started, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So how did you crunch the numbers for the science to the referral program, or did you? It, was it sort of like we need to do this, and that's how you approached it, or you like uh, the referral program? Yeah. Um. I think that was one of those things we might or might not have done because it was a lot of work to build a referral yourself. You know, cause we, I think we tested like 15 sites that do referrals and affiliation and all this kind of stuff and none of them kind of hit the mark. They're really complicated. You have to sign up and like get passwords and shit. Like it was, you know, it was, it was like nobody's going to do this. So like together we built a simple one which is pretty much like, you know, it will work if you don't like mess with the URL. So that took about, for us to build, uh, it didn't take that long actually. The hard part was the fact, oh and I forgot to mention this, the hard part was the fact that it was, it was real time. So if you, if you got a referral, like, you got your money back right away. So it kind of showed people that it worked. So what we did was we did integrate with Stripe on the back end and then what would happen is we would deduct money immediately and you would get an email saying, hey you got $5 back and this is $5 in your account. And I think people shared over and over. Like people would share on different sites because they would see that the money's coming back right. immediately. Right. So the real time nature of the of the referrals also mattered. It wasn't like, oh yeah, we'll send you money later kind of thing, you know. So that made a big difference. Yeah, I mean, uh, besides the engineering, also I mean, in terms of financials, like determining the amount or determining like. Uh, we just use ten percent. Okay. Yeah. Just figured like ten percent is a like, pretty good discount. Like five percent is kind of a small discount. And 20% is like too, you know? Mm -hmm. That was just, yeah. Okay. So speaking of testing, I, um, I'm a coin backer and I know that you're trying to get a beta beta mm -hmm. program going. I'm curious like how you're thinking about that beta program and what changes you think you can still make to the hardware or like what, what do you hope to learn, I guess, in that beta program and then how do you iterate from there? Uh, well, uh, the user experience is tantamount to success. So what we have to do is you know, like right now we're kind of like in an alpha mode. You know, like I have a coin, which is kind of like a beat up thing we made inside the house, you know, and you know, we're making, we made like several more last night. So like guys in the office will have them just to test. I think like I have personally never taken a hardware product all the way to the end before. But if I have any experience on the software side, which is that if you don't explore every corner case um, and find pretty much everything you possibly can with the, with the first like 50, 100 users, like when you multiply that with larger numbers, you can get all sorts of crazy stuff you never know, seen before. Right? So the whole goal is to not only see you know, the nuances, what can go wrong, but also to make it so that 
when someone uses it, it just feels easy. You know, it just it just kind of fits. And you can only do that by again, like the whole thing where yeah, yeah, you get humans to do it. Yeah. But do you will you have enough time in your talk? I don't know when you're like you should maybe shipping in August or right, will you have time to like if there is major issues in the hardware, right? Do you still have time to make changes in the schedule to, to launch you know, something a little better or different in in, in August? Um, well, time is always a crunch. Like you never are like, oh yeah, I got an extra month. You know, I'm just gonna take a break and do some extra, you know, video games. So time is always like in a crunch. So you know, if there's a big problem, we'll fix it first. I mean, there's there's no way out. You know, so the seven days a week is gonna be I don't know, seven and a half days. A week, I don't know. It's gonna it's gonna be longer hours basically to get it done right, because there's no point getting these out if they don't work right. right? So I think. In this case, what I've been advised is, and I don't have personal experience, that it has to work as more important than um, it being perfectly on time. Because people will carry these around for a while. So uh, I think we want to give them a better experience once it's in their hands. And then I, just another question, because uh, I, I know that um, right, it, no rechargeable battery. It's like the, you know, once the battery goes, it's, it's done. Right. Uh, do, so, can you talk? Uh, all of us kind of deal with power, you know, battery issues. Just was was it an internal like discussion? Like, how, how do you get to 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 that point where you say, you know what, it's just kind of non rechargeable. When it's done, it's done. You throw it out. Yeah. So, that's been the the most difficult part of uh, a, the feature decision. And like right now, we're sticking with our guns. You know, we might change it. I don't know. Like, you're never like it's never binary. Like, I'm always going to do this. I'm not going to do it. But the whole idea behind that was, like, everything we have, you have to charge. And the biggest reason I personally stop using any consumer electronic device I buy is because it runs out of battery and I forget to charge it. Okay, it just runs out of battery and it just runs out of battery for good. Happened to every single one of my Fitbits and fuel bands and everything I bought. It's all sitting out of battery on somewhere in my house. You know, I don't have any of it on me. This, I keep this because I have to, but <laughs> otherwise like everything else just dies and is gone. You know, so my idea was that like, we need to take this out of people's minds. You know? It's like, well, to have a product, you get some level of convenience, but then you have to maintain it. So like, where's the gain? Right? So what we still feel is that if you have something and it just kind of works day after day, you know, it's, it's, like a, it's like your card. Now, that was a problem too because people compared this to a card the card never has dies, right? You can use it for 20 years if it doesn't break into pieces. So they're like, look, my card lasts four years. Your card lasts two years. So like, what the heck? And I don't pay anything for my card. They're free to me. So that's how I think that that whole thing came out. And the message that, look, this is literally the only device you don't charge. It just kind of works for a long time. That message is kind of drowned out. Because people want, you know. And now, now I'm starting to think people like recharging stuff. <laughs> people like charging, you know? If people really like charging, then it's a good message, you know. Maybe at some point we might put a charger in there. You know? It's just more cost, oh, yeah, no, it's <laughs> and it's easier. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have to do less like we have to do a lot less, uh, you know, conserving energy and care less about the power budgets because we could be like, yeah, it works for ten days. It's a charger, <laughs> right? So uh, it was one of those things. It's actually easier to let it charge, you know, building an energy harvesting circuit and. I don't know, putting like one of those, uh, uh, what do you call it, the inductive charging pads, you can just buy them off the shelf, you know. So um, it was, it's actually harder to like just keep it going for several years, you know, and like the coin in my pocket has been running for a couple of months, it's still looking good. So we're kind of getting there with, with the power and we have some new things into place that kind of like reduces like the ambient power uses down to like nanoamps and kind of stuff. So like if you don't use it, it'll sit there for like 10 years. You know, uh, just kind of sitting around. So it's 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 challenging, but uh, I feel like it'll be a real solve for people. They will see it when it's with them, you know, because they'll be charging the, everything else they got, and then this one device will be just be on. They'll be like, okay, this is useful. Which one? Oh, um, you have to hire the right PR firm. Okay, so. Uh, we hired like VSC, Awareness. Um, they're like a local firm, um, and they they really like the product and they went they really did a good job. 
Like, they really went the distance with this, you know, and they had like six people on it or something, and like at different times, not at once, you know, and, and basically what happened was like in SF, they were, they were like continually meeting and coming up with pitch after pitch after revising their pitch to the press, and then like after we sent it out, um, they not only got a lot of interviews, I leveraged my investment network, all the investors, to be like, you know, I kept sending out lists to everyone and saying, introduce me to a guy you really know, right? And everybody kept making introductions to different people and we tied them all in. So together we had about 20 interviews lined up, uh, 22 or something like that. And, and basically what happens is, it happens like this, like you put them all, it's like pitching for, for funding, okay? You put all of them in the same week, like a couple of weeks before the launch, and then you get your PR firm to take you everywhere. Because technically your PR firm should know them, so they kind of like get the conversation started, get everything warmed up, and then you start pitching your, your product to the, to the, pre to the whoever the reporter is. And then, you know, like, generally if you have a good conversation, they'll write about it. Like, they won't skip you. Like, for us, we were lucky. Pretty much every single person that we talked to wrote about it. That's the goal. But generally, about 50, 40% will write about it. So if you meet 20 people, 10, you get 10 articles. That's what, I, and that's the rule of thumb. So what was your own budget for your uh, it was whatever they want to charge. It was, I'm sorry. Minus some negotiation. I, I didn't hear what you said. It was pretty much like whatever they want to charge, minus some level of negotiation, you know? So um, can you give us like a rough estimate, you know, as we're trying to put together our own performance and budgets together? It, every PR firm will charge you anywhere from like five to, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month. It's not cheap. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's one of those things. How many months did you work with them? Um, just kept going. I, what I told them was this, like, everything is merit and based on performance. If you guys do well, then there's no reason to, like, not work together. Right? So, but I, I didn't sign anything as far as, like, how long or, you know, like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I did do was actually was that I incent people. So there were some people by incented. I keep this within this room. I purposefully uh, said, if you make these numbers, I'll grant you some stock. And the reason I did that was because... Um, these people are motivated by the product and they want to be part of the company. So I was like, if you make this number, you get stock. You know? It's better than cash in some ways if they really care because then they're part of the company, right? Yeah, because then, then they have vested interest too, yeah. right? Because they're, they're part of that the whole thing. Uh, I try not to reward with any cash, like extra cash incentives. Because, you know, it's, as a company, you need cash, right? And having like the most, um, by the way, this stock grant is the most minuscule stock grant. It's not like you get a percent, no. It's like the tiniest stock grant. It's like, it's like, just, it's like if, you have, if you hire a developer and you give them a percent over four years, right? You know, or maybe a couple of percent over four years. It's, you know, it's, that's, they spend four years on it. These guys spend like two, three months. They get like a tiny amount. You know, so it won't like affect your cap tables. You won't be like, oh yeah, I got this PR firm with a big chunk of my company. No. Okay. So you got to be, uh, you got to make sure you negotiate that thing down. Whatever somebody tells you, just throw it out of the window and just tell them your terms. Would you end up putting the site in? I'm sorry? Would you use the site for the platform? Oh, uh, it, it was just a front end. Yeah, we didn't even build like a, an, a web app. It was just JavaScript. And if you need to submit something, we just did a JavaScript submit to an API. Yeah. I <laughs> kept this really simple. Because there's not enough time to build the full site, so we just, yeah, we just did it that way. Really simple. Oh, I forgot one thing. We did ads. I forgot about the ads. So there's, uh, there's two kind of ads. One is just simply just your ad, and the second one is like retargeting ads. Okay. Retargeting works way better than just like advertising. So on Facebook, uh, there's something called lookalike. It's like some beta features are there. You should get access to that. Basically what it does is, as you collect emails, you pump those emails back into Facebook, and they have the Facebook accounts, and they find users that are exactly the same, the people who are more likely to buy a product. You know, they have the highest conversion rates and lowest cost. And that worked really well. Um, Google retargeting was the cheapest. Like Google was by far like the most um, economical way of retargeting for folks. Um, and it consistently performed. Uh, at some point, we shut down Facebook because, like, Facebook was spamming people like nothing. Like, so people bought coin and then kept spamming them, and we're telling Facebook, like, 
Yeah, I'm like, they already bought it. I mean, know that. You have their email, so don't spam them. And they're like, <laughs> like OK, <laughs> we're going to stop using you then. Because <laughs> we don't want to annoy people. But we kept annoying people, you know? So it's because Facebook, it's, they're just like spamming impressions, you know? So um, what, what was the, the uh, program called for Facebook? Again? Look alike. Look alike, right. Okay. Interesting. Uh, can you tell me, like, approximately how much did you spend on ad advertising? And what was, like, the conversion rates? Um, the conversion rates were, like, 2 3% or something like that, maybe more at the beginning. So basically what happens is you get this you get this blip and then it like kind of like calms down over time. You know, and then you can focus on your product again. So it's kind of it's kind of like in steady state for now. Um, I can't reveal to you like all the expenditures of it cuz we're just kind of keeping all that kind of under wraps for now. But um, what the trend you will see is like at the beginning, like we started our retargeting like immediately. Uh, because once you create the engine um, it's slowing down. It's like a train slowing down. To like speed it up, you have to spend a lot more energy and time and money to speed it up. So what we did, we tried to just capitalize it before like the numbers went back down. Uh, we just tried to keep it, keep the you know, keep the fuel going. So like a couple of days after the campaign, we started the, the advertising and just kind of kept it rolling, kind of like steady state from then forward. And basically, what you will see is like your numbers will get into steady state. So there'll be a big sharp kind of incline at the beginning, and then it'll kind of like turn this law curve, right? Uh, at some point, you can decide like, look, you know what? You know, we don't, any more, like, we don't need any more Delta users. We just want to deliver the product so you can just shut it down at that point. Because it turns out that after you deliver your product, if you're successful in like, its quality and people start using it, you'll see the, the organic growth go up. Because it'll be out there, people will see it, you know, it'll be more, um, how do you say, um, it'll, be, it'll spread a little easier. But, but do you have any uh, insights in, like, if you spend $100 on advertising, how many mm -hmm. dollars do you get back in, in like, pre-orders? <coughs> that oh, that just, that just depends on how well it's performing. So we try to keep, for us, we try to keep the, like, the spending really low per unit. You know, so the goal wasn't to, like, get as many units sold as possible. The goal was to do, sell as many units very economically, like, really cheap as possible. So we focus that way. And so generally, like I've heard of people doing like where if they sell, like if they charge $50 and they, and through the ads, if they, it costs $50 to sell one, they're okay with that. They're okay with like breaking even though. No. So it just depends on how much you want to fuel your, your campaign right? and, how, and how, how big are your conversion rates. Because the conversion goes up, all the costs go down. Right? And that has a lot to do with your, your ads. It has a lot to do with how easy it is to convert on your site. So all that has to work together, and you know you have to kind of organ, you have to monitor it carefully. Can you elaborate more on the timeline and sort of manpower involved with the campaign, separate from the development, and sort of like you know how long was the embargo for? When did the ad spend really kick up? Things like that. Yeah, so about four weeks out, four to six weeks out, we started sending emails to reporters. Okay, that we knew, and we had this massive list of like two hundred reporters or something. I forgot exactly. You know, and there were all sorts of, some were relevant, some were not. But out of those, like, 10 or 15 were, like, the ones we do want to talk to completely. Like, we definitely, definitely want to talk to. And, and reporters, like, generally are really busy, so they won't talk to you until your product launches. So you can't talk to a reporter four weeks ahead. They'll be like, well, come back later when you're launching. So as we started lining up uh, these kind of, like, meetings, we all made them on the same week. It was really, really important to get them all together. Um, and that was, so if this is launch date, like, it, so we did it Thursday, right? So I should do it this way. Like Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday was SF. You know, and nobody works on, the person don't really work that much on Saturday and Sunday. And then the week before, starting Tuesday to Friday was New York. So, and it was really tiring and like all day long, like day to night, you keep going, you keep going, going. Stuff gets rescheduled, then you have to get them in at the night. You know, like, it's, so it's, it's, uh, it's like a really, really busy process, basically, to get it all done. And the other ones, like, you're saying the targeting? Oh, uh, yeah, like the, the timing of the ad spends. Um. So the timing of the ad spend was two days after launch. You know, basically what happened was this. When you launch on a Thursday, Saturday kind of kills your momentum because people start going outside. They're not surfing the web at work. 
So we started this ad spend, like maybe even the Monday after, something like that. And basically what we did was uh, we took, um, like we had several creatives that we had created, which is like the, the picture you see on the ad. And I hired like a, um, a, a guy who's a statistician, kind of like good at these ads, you know, and he was working part time on them uh, from then on forward. Um, also I hired like some social media guys who could just keep posting on Twitter and, and so on and so on, and Facebook and all these kind of different channels. So just to have conversations, people have questions. Um, you need the help because what will happen is if you, have, if you have a big campaign, this is what's going to happen. It's going to go great. All these positive articles will come out, you know, and you'll be like, wow, I, you know, we're doing well. This is excellent. They never expected this. And then at some point, you know, somebody's going to be like, oh, well, I think you have a problem with this, problem with that, you know, and then a lot of hecklers and trollers will come out. And at that point, you know, what you have to do is your PR firm, you have to be ready to address that and maybe even do like a second, like a PR push, like a week or two later, just to address that. If that happens to you, you know you have done a good job with your, it's expected, basically. So, so how many people did you have engaged in the, in the, in the for the period of the launch? Um, so it was the developers, it was the social media guys, it was the, the, the PR firm, um, it was the ad guys, um, what else? about it, I think. It's about four or five different eight, uh, folks. And they're all on a, on a contract. None of them were full-time back then. Did you have any bad partnerships that you have gotten any experience with that sort of slowed you down, or and how did you handle that, or did everything just go run smoothly? As far as the launch is concerned? Um, See, for the launch, everything, actually, we we're just fortunate. Like, things just kind of clicked. But if you do run into something or something you feel like they're not performing, you address it as soon as possible. Don't let it go. So, you know, like, let's say four weeks out, you're sending, you know, emails to, to certain, you know, the press that you're targeting, and you're not getting replies back or you're not getting thing. Like, you take care of it right away. Like, don't sit around. You know, so you might get another firm or you talk to the firm, you're like, look, you know, you guys, um, no, let's redo the pitch. Let's, you know, like, so you have to constantly work through the issues. So don't take any, don't take like no's or like lack of um, traction anyway laying down. You know, you really have to move fast and then just do like whatever it takes and not worry about feelings and things like that. So you mentioned you're more concerned with profit than or like margin than pure volume. But what were some of the metrics that you were like really trying to hit uh, to get to like your next inflection point? Was it to like, you know, we need this much margin and profit to get raise around A, or like, what, what was the, what were you shooting for with the campaign? Oh, um, the biggest metric we were trying to hit was the conversion. So the way I looked at it, if 100 people come on the site, I want 100 people to buy it. That, that's pretty much, like, if you need one metric, it's the people who, how many people who come to your site purchase the thing. I think that's really important. So, we were just chasing that, and we were constantly monitoring that. A site that actually was really good, that nobody ever talks about, is uncrate.com for consumer electronics stuff. It won't work for like you know like enterprise kind of hardware, but for consumer electronics, uncrate. U N C R A T E. That site performed really well. Like people kept coming in. That makes sense that uh, maximizing conversion because if somebody else, as an investor, is looking at it, they can do the math, right? They could say, if I apply another hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars at that conversion rate, you know, yeah, it's that, that would be the result, right? You know, it, it yeah. becomes academic. If you can put a formula on the board where you're like, it cost me this money to get these many, and here's my revenue out of that, and then it put it in the real world and it works. If you can simulate that and actually apply to the real world, it's golden. Because yeah. all you have to do to scale is that's just scale, right? Increase, increase your spend slowly, right? Because right. 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 the numbers start. It means yeah, you to go too fast. In a way. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's like a really, really great place to be, I think. Oh, one more thing that I didn't talk about was uh, community. So it turns out that after you do your campaign, your community is the most important thing. 
because you can really leverage them for several things, right? Excitement and uh, more backers. Because the fact that they paid, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling thing where like if you paid for something, you think it's good. And the fact that you did it, you can't be proved wrong that you're not smart about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so your backers will back you, you know? Um, the vast majority of them, they'll keep on, you know? So if you give them a reason to share more, you give them a reason to like talk about it more, the word keeps spreading. That's really important. So what we did was this, like immediately afterwards, we started sending emails to the, to the backers and then created a template where they can keep coming back and created like a password and stuff so it, like it's only for them. So it kind of creates like this, you know, uh, community of folks and uh, it's more of a discussion forum and, and a way to get feedback on your product ahead. Uh, that really like helped us kind of fine tune um, how we're making coin a little different because there's so much feedback that's coming in, a little too much actually. So um, the, the leveraging a community is important. Every time we send an email, we get like a sharp increase in traffic on our site. We get a sharp increase in the pre-orders and things like that. So we try to send one out every couple of weeks and then we hire another video firm to like uh, create videos. So once a month, we'll send a new video out, which is a lot of work, but you know, it really helps us think through the product too. Right? So it's all an exercise that really helps working together with a bunch of folks. How big is your team? It's like 25 people. That all happened like within the last few months. So it was like six people when we launched. And then, you know, uh, uh, I'm glad you asked that question. So another thing that we didn't consider, which was a big issue, was support. Support. So we didn't anticipate support at all. But I think we had like 10,000 tickets or something like that on Zendesk like within the first couple of hours or something like that. I forgot exactly. You know, it was, it was like really, like it took like a month or two to catch up to all the requests, support requests. And uh, so we literally had to hire like a head of support and like we have like seven or eight people constantly answering tickets. Like folks submit questions all over the place and we have to constantly address them. So um, support is something just to look into, at least set up the tools so you can start monitoring what people are saying and talk to them because people really appreciate like a human being answering, you know? And quick, if you do, the quicker you do it, the better they feel about it, even if they don't like you. And if they don't like you, it's good, by the way. Because I feel like a user, somebody who has an emotional reaction to your product, uh, even if it's negative, is a potential user because they care about that domain, you know? They care about that area enough to either really like you or not like you. So, um, you know, embrace those people who don't really like you because they're potential users in the future. People who are passive, those are the ones that are a problem because they just don't care. They're like, we'll do whatever, I don't care. <laughs> it's the opposite of what you want. You, know, you want people to like, you know, really like care a lot one way or another. Which, which guys, uh, who's launching a pre-order campaign? Are you guys considering? You guys are? The future. These guys are right up against it. You guys are? Yeah, it was, it was planned for April, but we'll see. <laughs> it's April. Yeah, it's gonna get delayed. But, uh, what is it now? April 3rd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, probably gonna happen in June. June, oh yeah. Oh, cool, guys. Did you, did you think about um, distance from launch to uh, product shipped and have a, a mental model there? Yeah, but we left for about six months because that's how much more work we needed to do. Kind of back, and, and it was that kind of backed in to say that, that's kind of my mental model, which would be like, you know, I get delivered in you know December or June. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. People only have so much patience. Right? Yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, did you know how many units you had to like have pre-ordered to to make a profit of the entire campaign, pre-order campaign? Uh, we weren't trying to make a profit. Yeah, because. All we were trying to do was like show that our company deserves to exist, you know. So like we're making something, we already spent a year on it. We don't want to go further and then like be like nobody wants to use this thing. So we were the the main goal besides you know selling some stuff was to find a product market fit. Like, is there 
you know, somebody who wants to use this. Uh, there's some people who really want to use this. Like, you know, and I really understand who those people are so that uh, we can justify the fact that we'll build these and spend all that extra money to get manufacturing to scale and all that kind of stuff. So, um, that, I mean, that was, that was the main goal. As far as profits are concerned, I think you can, you can uh, put the money back in the company and not worry about the profit. You know? Like, if there's no way you can, you can, there's no way you will make profit, that's different. But, you know, if you break even or in a negative, in an early stages like this, it's okay because um, your goal is to, to kind of like start your company and get it to a point where like you have a revenue stream that's reliable and you can grow that revenue stream into a massive company. Right? That's really the goal. Where's the revenue stream and how you can grow it? So that requires you to have uh, some good investors. The money's not coming you know, from the customers, it's gonna come from somewhere else. So I guess I'm a little curious, you know, the, the crowdfunding myth is that, oh, you build it, then you put it out there, and then yeah. you get investment, but, you know, the ad spend, the PR, this costs money early, so. Yeah, so. Speak to the fundraising strategy. Fundraising strategy, okay. That's the most fun part. Um, so what I, what I did at Coin was, um, when I had, like, really, really, like, bad prototypes, now that I realize, I thought they were good back then. You know, like, wires hanging out and stuff like that. Um, um, what I did was I started to kind of like network around and trying to find more and more people who would be interested in coins. So um, first I made a pitch, okay, very simple pitch. Like, you know, I made a deck that actually I didn't end up using, but it helped me get my mind together in the sense that I know how to present a company to an investor so that it gives the company a best chance of getting invested. How do you like prepare such a presentation and how do you talk in such a manner that an investor is like, yeah, this guy can make a company. You know, like every founder that comes in obviously really loves their product and can talk about it, you know, with a lot of kind of like passion and drive behind it. Question is can they make a business out of it, right? It's a company after all. So making that pitch is important. And that might take you like two, three, four weeks to get it right. And you have to talk about it maybe a hundred times to someone. Like pitch it like a hundred times. You know, so that you just kind of get used to it. Get to the point where you're bored of your pitch. You're like, I, if I speak about this one more time, I'm just gonna lose it. You know, like get to that level. And, um, and then, you know, take a bunch of caffeine, line up some investor meetings, and then keep pitching and keep pitching. You'll get a bunch of feedback. And uh, the, the interesting moment comes is when, um, you know, you get, you get that lead, you know, the seed round lead. We'll put in a good, like a half a million, a million in your company to get you going, basically. And then once you get that guy, the rest of the angel investors just drop like crazy. Like, they'll just like, you just go pitch a bunch of people, you don't worry about it that much. Because you, know, you already have the chunk of the money you're raising. And like, and then, um, you know, you gather like 50K, 100K at a time over, you know, course of like a month or two even. Because you already have enough to get going. Have you guys raised seed rounds in here? Not yet? Okay. Yeah, uh, before you launch, raise a seed. <laughs> yeah, go, go raise a seed around. It's really important. Because resources change everything. When you have money to spend in a company, you can hire people, it changes everything. You know, so like, whoever is your like, CEO, or gonna be CEO, um, needs to like, really focus and understand how what it takes to raise money. Because without capitalization, you're always gonna be like, do I like, you know, eat, or do I buy my, like, you know, the next rev of the hardware? Like, that's, you know, that's, uh, a tough situation to be in because, you know, you can't go all out, right? So go, go, go raise a seed round. It could be as low as like, you know, a few hundred K, that's enough to get going. And it could be, you know, you can raise rounds that are like a couple of million in seed. I think the right amount for a hardware company is about 2.5 million. If you really want to like make a company that scales, raise 2.5, no less. Because otherwise you'll find yourself like against all these blocks you're like, oh yeah, I can't pay for that. You go talk to like TI and they'll be like, um, so uh, <laughs> you're talking to me, like can you pay for any of this? You know, all these partners, like they're, you know, they're, they're just there to sell, so they don't want to talk to anybody who doesn't have money to pay. So that's really important. And then when you have a team, you know, um, and you do a launch, you can hire the PR firm. 
Like, who wants to pay $10,000 for a PR firm and you don't have a seat around? You can't, you know? It's very difficult to, to come up with that money. Um, uh, you want to have, build your own site. You need software engineers to help you, you know? So you might have to pay someone. If you don't have someone in-house, you have to pay someone maybe, you know, 25000 to make a site exactly the way you want it, right? To fine tune it, to make it your masterpiece. So it's really important to raise money. And when we go to bigger rounds, it's all about, um, bigger rounds are all about, um, like, does your product show a fit and how finished is your prototype so that there's, like, less product risk, right? Then you can go out and raise, like, a, a chunk of money, maybe five, ten million in one go. Then you can make, you know, your own office and all that kind of stuff um, to get it going. But I think unless you know someone really well and you're really good at networking and Venture, uh, that would be something you probably do after you do your crowdfunding campaign. Can you talk a little bit about your domain name choice? Uh, oh, um, yeah. It, it was the cheapest one. There, it was like twelve ninety nine on GoDaddy. Yeah, there's like trends like get get something or like. Oh uh, yeah, something. yeah. It was just like the cheapest one. Okay. Your domain is not gonna make or break you. Just don't get a domain like, you know, which is super long, <laughs> two syllables, one syllable. Yeah. Which is your domain? Only coin. Only coin. Yeah, I think coin dot com would have cost a lot. We, I couldn't even get the guy to sell. I tried. I couldn't get the guy to sell it. Yeah, so whatever. It, it's not a big difference um, for that. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me here, guys. Thank you. Yeah.